Like it is one of the most hurtful things to to go through, right? When you're trying to do everything that you that you could do to be a part of that child's life, but to have someone say, "Oh, you know what? You're only worthy of having first, third, fifth weekend, thirty days in the summer." That that's a trauma that people don't talk about, right? We don't we don't we don't talk about the 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 emotional effects that come with that. That you know, out of 365 days in a year, you're only allowed to see your child. However, many of those are weekends and a month in the summer. What's up, y'all? Welcome to the latest edition of the number one podcast for black parents, black people parenting. I'm your host, the glad dad, Dion Chavis, family engagement educator. On the episode today, we got a special guest, somebody that I've been knowing for a very, very long time. Uh, She is going to chime in and we're going to talk to her about uh, some really interesting topics that I think are important. Uh, She goes by the name of Heather Nicole Johnson Esquire. (laughs) She is a a family, is a family law attorney. I want to be sure that I'm saying that properly. That is correct. Okay. So she is a family law attorney and the topic of today's episode is going to be navigating uh, custody disputes and family law. So Heather, I want you to, you know, talk to us a little bit about who you are, about what you do. You're in the Dallas Fort Worth area. You're getting all the clients out there. Your Instagram handle is something that I love. She got him custody. Um, I think that's super dope. So talk to us a little bit about who you are, what your mission is, what your purpose is and the work that you do. So as you said, I'm Heather Nicole Johnson. I am a family law, family law attorney here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I practice my, mainly in Dallas County, Tarrant County, which, which most people would be familiar with Fort Worth. Um, Collin County, most people would be familiar with Plano or with an Allen uh, outlet shooting was tragically a few months ago, a few weeks ago. That's Collin County. Um, so those are the, the counties that I primarily practice in. And what I do is I handle all the really personal and sensitive and super, super important family issues um, that go before the court, such as divorce, custody disputes between parents, child support uh, issues, things of that nature. Um, and I've been practicing, believe it or not, for 10 years. So like you said, we've known each other forever, but... Right. I literally have been practice only practicing those 10 years out of the time I've known you. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mostly represent fathers and husbands who uh, tend to unfortunately feel that, you know, the judici- judicial system is not uh, or is biased against them. And so um, hence the handle. And just statistically, for whatever reason, I don't know if it's just the law of nature, most men tend to gravitate towards female attorneys for these types of legal issues anyway. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Um, most times you'll be in court, you'll see the husband or the, 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 the ex or the child's father being represented by a woman. <laughs> Every now and then I'll see a guy represented by a guy, but it's very rare. It's, it's not nearly as common. Absolutely. So men do, you know, do call the office. They are looking for assistance with these issues and I'm ha- more than happy to help. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I, you know, speaking from experience, it's funny that you said that because I had a couple of lawyers when I was going through my journey in family court and the lawyer who was the, the best, who got me the best results. No, both lawyers that got me the best results were women. They were black women specifically. Um, so I have no problem saying, fellas, if you are planning on going to court for any sort of family law issues, get you a black woman lawyer because they are going to get the job done. They know how to navigate the system. They know they stuff. They don't play no games. Uh, yeah. And I'm speaking from experience. That one time that I had a man lawyer, it was a white man lawyer. Respectfully, he was the worst lawyer I could have chosen. Like I knew he was the wrong lawyer when he walked in and his pants were too big and the cuffs of his pants were dragging on the bottom of his shoes. You know, I've seen right memes there. about that. I've seen memes about that. But, you know, ironically, that it, it's funny you bring that up because ironically, our community, our people mm-hmm. will go and pay their last dollar to get that representation and then come back with these stories of how they weren't represented adequately, how their money was taken, how they weren't, you know, apprised of their, um, or kept, uh, 
informed of the updates of their case, the progress of their mm -hmm. case. We get those complaints all the time. And then you want to come back and then you don't have any money. Well, that's not how it works. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because, yeah. because white lawyers, black lawyers, we all have bills. We all are in business to help and to do well. You know what I mean? So yeah. no one works for free. Yeah. I was young and dumb and didn't know anything. And I was trying to get the best deal. And yeah. Nah, oh, and you get, you, and you, get you get what you pay for. And you get what you get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. You get what you pay for. So let's 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 kind of dive in a little bit. What are some of the most common misconceptions that you see from uh, people who come to you about family law, trying to figure out like how to navigate the system? What are what are some of the most common misconceptions that you think people have? Um, I think. I hear a lot, you know, if there's a financial discrepancy between the parties, you know, she doesn't, she just has an apartment. I have a four bedroom house. Doesn't that matter? Doesn't the court care about that? Mm, not really. Mm -hmm. um, you know, from a layman perspective, we can see, well, obviously the kid's going to be living better in that four bedroom house, right? But that's not how the court looks at it. The court is taking, taking into consideration the emotional and the mental well-being of the child as a factor. And if we all know, even as adults, a four-bedroom house, if we're going to stay on that example, doesn't buy you love and happiness, right? right. So, so or stability. So um, that's one of the common misconceptions because a lot of times you will get outplayed in court if the other party has more money. It's just, it's, a, it's an unfortunate um, way that it works, but you know, that financial discrepancy, the, 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 the playing field is actually more even than you would think. That's where I'm going with it. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a concern that I get a lot. Um, another concern that I get um, people or, or couples, a lot of men who are about to, and I guess I have to kind of make this all come full circle. Quite often in family law cases, when you're dealing with people or parents who never marry, but they have a child together, and let's say they don't work out. Five years go by, 10 years may go by, and oh, we're cool. That's my child's father. That's my mom, mm -hmm. my, my, my baby's mom. We're good. We're great. Until you decide you're going to get a girlfriend, get mm. engaged or get married, any of those three, I can guarantee you, is going to be the basis for 99% of the men that walk into my office requesting a modification or defending a modification of sorts because people get jealous. They become, you know, but with that part, that's a whole nother rabbit hole. The concern becomes if I marry, Joe Blow or, or Jane Doe, is her income considered or taken into consideration for child support? I get that question a lot. In the state of Texas, it is not. But in some other states, it may very well be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, okay, so let's say I come into your office and I'm, and again, this is none of this is legal advice or anything like that. Um, but if I, if I come into your office as someone who is looking for, uh, representation. What are some of the things that you think I can do to, to demonstrate that I'm fit as a parent um, to, you know, to, to come out on top in, in my case? Because when you're going in these cases, like you, you, you're going in to win, like you ain't going in to lose. So how can I demonstrate that I am best suited to get the things that I'm asking for uh, in the court? So quite oftentimes, you know, we go, we want to go in, you know, guns blazing to throw the other person under the bus, throw shade to say, hey, judge, look at what he did. Look at what she did. Look at what they did. This, 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 and they did this on this date and on that date and this text message and this email. And all of that is valuable. It has value. It's useful. But what I tell my clients, the goal is not to go and have this, you know, slug fest against the other side. The other, the goal here is to show why you are the better choice, why you are the better parent 
for for lack of a better word, because it's not a competition, but you, you get what I'm saying. Why you're the better choice for the children, why it's in the children's best interest. That's the standard that Texas uses. Mm -hmm. um, instead of constantly, you know, railing on the other side. Let's talk about how often you take the children to the doctor. Let's talk about how many parent teacher conferences you're attending. Let's talk about how many sports and games you're showing up to. Let's talk about how many hours a night you are helping with homework. Let's talk about how many, you know, um, extracurricular activities you guys engage in together on the weekends. Let's talk about how great you are instead of talking about how awful the other parent is. But I'm not going to go in there talking about your greatness if your greatness is not true. So these are things that you need to be implementing. You need to be involved in your kids' medical um, the, the, the medical aspects of their lives, the educational aspects of their lives, the um, health and, you know, dental, all of it. You need to be involved and have knowledge. I can't tell you the number of times I've had someone on cross and I've won a case just by merely asking a simple question. What size diaper does your two-year-old wear? Wow. He, no clue. No clue. Mm -hmm. No answer. Yeah. What's your What's your child's math teacher's name? No clue. Right. Couldn't answer. Right. What shoe size does your daughter wear? No clue. So these know. are things right. that I hone in on, you know, to show the absence of the other parents' um, concerns or efforts or parenting skills, but. The, the the crux of my case presentation is going to be about your greatness and your awesomeness. So you talked about the best interest of the child, and that's something that I have struggled with over the years, right? Because I've always felt like best interest of the child is something that is very subjective. Uh, I feel like it was something that I believe just, and this is from my years of researching back when I was going through it, originated from the tender years doctrine back when uh, husbands were coming home from the World War II and, you know, all of these things, right? Um, and I feel I like everybody has a different idea of what the best interest of the child is. Uh, dive in a little bit into that about best interest of the child and talk to uh, that point. Uh, as parents, we, you know, going through this, we have to, to, to look for what the courts would say is the best interest of the child. So, Let's, if you could, provide a working definition, if it's possible, and kind of talk a little bit to that. If I had to, um, just based if on my experiences and based on, you know, remarks from judges and rulings through the years, I would say that the best interest of the child is mostly based on or, or mostly determined by whether or not that thing or that someone or that circumstance negatively impacts that child's mental or physical well-being. That's the best way that I can explain it. If it threatens mm -hmm. that child's mental or physical well-being, then it's not in their best interest. So that's typically, I, and, and I agree with you 100%, it is, it is extremely subjective. And that is why, before I go into that rabbit hole, that's why elections matter, because subjectiveness can be, um, you can have similar similarities in how you observe or perceive something culturally, right? So mm -hmm. the subjective, the subjectiveness, if that's a word of it, is actually mostly determined by who's sitting behind the bench. Right. Right. And for us specifically, you know, I've always said that a lot of times as fathers, when we go into these courtrooms, um, you know, it's it's designed, it's not designed for, for us to win, right? These these situations aren't designed for um, fathers to win these types of cases because just, you know, when you look at historically, there's always the burden of proof that relies on the father uh, to prove that he is fit, right? The society tells her that if the mom is 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 there, uh, uh, she is 
perfect for the child. And even if we're talking about 50, 50 custody, like as a father, I always felt going into these situations that I had to go above and beyond just to prove that I was worthy of being in my child's life. I tell, I tell dads all the time in these conversations that I have with them, that it's easier to go into a courtroom and say, I want to relinquish my responsibilities as a father than it is to go into a courtroom and say, I like to split custody of my child, right? It's, it's a much easier process because when they, when you go in and you say that you want to take 50, 50 custody, physical and legal custody, 50, 50 down the middle, you get looked at differently. And there's a, there's a different, you know, it's, I don't think it's something that is said, but it's different. Right. So I want to, I want to talk to, I want to, I want you to talk now to talk about um, the differences between um, physical custody, legal custody, uh, and what that actually means. Because a lot of times dads will go in there and they'll say, okay, well, I'll give you 50, 50 legal, but you don't get 50, 50 physical. Right. Which then in turn affects how much you have to pay for child support. It affects how many nights uh, uh, the child spends with you. It affects all of those things. Right. So if you have a lawyer or someone who doesn't necessarily explain the differences to you about the difference between uh, physical custody and legal custody, you might think that you're going in there for one thing and getting one thing, but you're not getting that at all. So kind of explain the difference between what physical custody and what legal custody means. That was an awesome question. And I actually want to circle back to a previous question when you asked me what are some of the things that come up most often. And I don't know why that slipped my mind, because mm -hmm. that issue does come up a lot. People walk in and they say, well, I'm at home, so this isn't my actual office. But <laughs> people walk in and they say, you know, I just want 50-50. Okay, well, 50-50 physically? Or are you saying you want to share the rights and duties equally with the other party? Mm -hmm. So quick, quick, quick lesson, legal lesson. North Carolina, just like Texas, it's a common law state. We don't have what you call uh, custody. We have what you call conservatorships, which I'm sure you're familiar with that term if you've been through this process mm -hmm. before. Um, and a conservatorship is actually the um, title because you can be a non-parent conservator, right? You, the mm -hmm. conservatorship is what gives you the right to be able to make decisions for your children, decide where they go to school, where they reside, mm -hmm. primarily, all of those things. Well, in Texas, we have what we call a joint managing conservatorship and a sole managing conservatorship. Now, what does that mean? The joint managing is the closest to what people mean when they say, I want 50-50. Here's why. So in the state of Texas, the legislators decided that, or, or that the presumption would be that the joint managing conservatorship is in the best interest of the child. And that typically means that both parties have the same rights and duties, except one party has the exclusive right to determine where the child lives, okay? That's a joint managing conservatorship. Now, with those rights and duties, the possession schedule is typically what we call a standard possession schedule in Texas, which would give the other parent the first, third, and fifth weekend of every month alternating mm -hmm. holidays 30 days in the 30 consecutive days in the summer in however the summer, yeah. we can get a little creative and you know do make things you know if the part so long as the parties agree the courts typically don't go outside the bounds of a standard possession order but sometimes depending on the child the circumstances and all that they will okay so that is a joint managing conservatorship with a standard possession order. So you've got your rights and duties, the, the things that you can do with and for your child, and you've got the amount of time and days that you can spend with your child. So those are two things. The sole managing conservatorship means that only one parent has all of the rights and duties. Now, this is the mm -hmm. hardest conservatorship to get because there's typically neglect, abuse, um, you know, alcohol abuse, criminal activity, or something that's mm -hmm. present that would 
or family violence is usually the big one too, I'm sorry, um, mm -hmm. that will cause or justify a court rendering or appointing someone as a sole managing conservator. Now, you dad, I'm mom, I'm sole managing, you're just a possessory conservator, which means, is, which means you don't really have any real rights to make decisions about our child, but you can still have that same standard possession schedule that I just talked about. Mm -hmm. so that first, third, and fifth. You can still have that same visitation. It's mm -hmm. just that the rights and duties aren't going to be the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference between, as you put it, legal and physical custody. The physical custody is called possession and access in Texas or visitation. Mm -hmm. um, and then the actual legal custody that you're referring to, which means the rights and duties, those are the conservatorship that we're discussing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that like clear? Said, yeah. And, and like you said, the, the rights and duties, a lot of times, just in layman's terms, like you have, you have the right to, you know, have input or say or access to medical records, education records. Educational um, records. Yeah. Um, you have the right you know, to determine to where to the child visits. resides. Yes, right. you get to go to yeah, all that. You got it. So you know when when that is fifty fifty, what they're what the courts are saying is that they want you to work with the other parent to uh, come to decisions, right? On who's going to be the okay. doctor, who's going to do this, who's going to do that. Um, but again, a lot of times the person who is not, and I, you know, I hate the term, <laughs> I hate the term custodial and non custodial. I really hate those terms. Uh, but the person who um, has custody of the child, right, who has physical who custody the child, of the child. The person who the child resides with primarily. Yes. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, yes. Yes. That's a great way to put it. The person who the child resides with primarily uh, oftentimes gets to make those decisions. And as the person who does not uh, reside with the child, you know, sometimes even though you might have, you know, joint legal custody, you're still left in the dark because you still feel like there is nothing uh that you don't have any say so, right? But I think it's important for fathers to educate themselves to say that, okay, even if I do only have uh, joint physical, I'm sorry, joint uh, legal, pardon me, uh, there's still things that I can do to be sure that I am uh, involved in the decision making. And I think a lot of times where uh, fathers specifically get messed up is because we don't educate ourselves, right? We don't educate ourselves on the laws. We don't educate ourselves on what our rights are. I tell any dad, like once you find out that you have uh, a baby on the way, I don't care if y'all are together, if y'all have been high school sweethearts for 25 years, you still need to educate yourself on the rights. So speak a little bit to the importance of knowing like the terms. Like I I, I learned the hard way. I learned all this stuff through <laughs> literally through Your trial. Your beautiful and error. Like, daughter literally. used to post her all the time. I remember. How I, old is I, she now? I still do when she, yeah. She's 19. Oh my God. Jesus and she has oh six Lord. tattoos. How's that? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, 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 this has literally been, it was trial and error for me. And I, I made it a point to educate myself. So I want you to kind of speak to, because you're dealing with the dads and you're dealing with the parents who are coming in. Uh, why is it important to know these things before you go into, even into a lawyer's office, right? And, and not to get on a, on a, on a, on a soapbox, but you know, there are a lot of, things that dads or parents can do in these situations themselves. We talked about the cost a little bit, right? We talked about how costly it can be, but some things you can do, like you can file certain motions on your own, right? There's a lot of times you don't necessarily need to go into a lawyer until it's, you really, really need it. I, That's, that, I agree. That, that was I, I, my belief. I can see the logic push back behind if you need to. Push back belief. if you need to. But here's why I'm going to push back because it's, mm -hmm. we are literally probably the only profession, uh, uh, yeah, I'd probably say we're one of the few professions, I'll go that far, I'll, I'll say that, where people think they can just do it themselves and wing it themselves. No, you you don't, that, the risk is too great. You mm -hmm. don't know how to proffer evidence and get it admitted into court. 
you don't know how to timely appeal something if you aren't happy with the decision. You don't know how to subpoena a witness and, and then have them sworn in on the record. You don't know how to do these things. So no, you mm -hmm. should not be, oh, I can just file this motion and it's not gonna be a big deal. No, no, ideally, ideally, if you and the mom or you and the dad, the other parent had a civilized relationship and you guys just want to memorialize your agreement and file it with the court in terms of he's going to pay me this every month. My kid's going to go visit him every month or on these days and these times. Go for it. But when we're talking about hardcore procedure, we're talking about issues that need to be addressed right. and dealt with. We're talking about things that need to be on the record. We're talking about uh, you representing yourself and then the other side goes and gets somebody like me. And I'm gonna kick your butt. Yeah, right. Well, I'm right, kidding. Right. Yeah, right. No, no, no. I, I, no, no. Listen, I never recommend anyone uh, uh, represent themselves ever, ever, ever. What I, what I'm saying is that preliminary stuff, like you know, if the if if you want to file a motion to amend, right? That's like that's pretty. That's well, once well, I I I don't speak or can't speak for other attorneys, but once you I, you've retained my services. Mm -hmm. you're not doing any work. The only work mm -hmm. that you're doing or is giving me what I need or what I'm asking right, for. Right, right. That is my job to file, to keep track. Our, my, my office, not a shameless plug at all. This is just the way my, our system is set up. My, my case out. manager takes your calls. She's, if you are willing to pay for the consultation, she gets you on my calendar. Um, and then we, you come in, whether you want to go Zoom or in person, it's up to you. And we hammer through up to an hour. We hammer through these issues. And I do school clients or potential clients on the lingo because, like you said, a lot of people just don't know. And to your point, I agree that people need to educate themselves. But sometimes you just don't even know what you don't know. So where would you start looking? You know what I mean? So I try my hardest, especially within our community, when I have black men um, who are going through these, you know, hard times or stress, stressful times, I make a point to let them know, you know, you, yes, you are the dad. This is the judge. This is how this judge operates. This is the county you're in. Because what people don't understand also not defending the legal profession, but who you retain as an attorney is extremely important, but equally as important, but unfortunately you have zero control over it. It's who the judge is as well. Who the judge is. And that's absolutely. why I said earlier, elections matter. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to speak on a case that happened uh about a year and a half ago but i'm gonna just use some fake names because obviously i can't you okay. know but i was in collin county now that part is true i was in collin county if you know anything about texas first of all you know texas is a well now we're a purple state but for the most part it's red in a mm. lot of these um outer line communities with the exception of dallas dallas is dallas county is blue so I've got this conservative, young, white, female judge sitting on the bench. I'm representing a doctor who thought it was a good idea to um, toss away his ex's belongings when she left him. And we're not talking about, oh, he just threw away some AirPods or he just threw away a pair of shoes. He no. threw the Birkin bags out. He threw, the, he threw the Louis and the Gucci out. Mm. And here's, here, here's the thing. Not only did he do that, but she testified that she was depressed and that she felt like since she'd had their baby, she had never felt like herself again. Now, come on. White female judge young conservative you're telling her that you just tossed away a brand new mom who's probably going through postpartum mm -hmm. you did that 
Oh, <laughs> give me his head. I want his head on a platter. And that's exactly right. what the ruling looked like. Now, if we now not to say what he did wasn't egregious, but I can I'm willing to bet if I was in another county. While he would have been sanctioned or punished or whatever the case may have been, it may have been perceived a little differently because the fact that he was an educated black man, I believe, mm -hmm. may have come into play. But right. for the other judge, she didn't care. It was like, you're trash. You're throwing this out. This lady is, you know, so that's my point. It's all about who's sitting and listening to this case. Yeah, and you you made a good point about like the location of the case, right? Um, and I don't want to I want to dive too deep into that, but you know it's important to know like where you because sir, at, at least when I was going early on, right? Because I, I think I think that uh, times have changed in the last nineteen years to a degree, but you know, nineteen years ago there were less judges sitting on the benches and less folks who were likely to say, oh, okay, this is a father. He's just as fit as a mom is to, to, uh, to take care of this child. Um, now I would, I would like to think that we are a bit more progressive in that area. Uh, but like you said, it's important to know, and, 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 you know, you don't, you don't think about like, oh, well, I'm going to, you know, have a, a, a child with a woman who lives in this County or right, you know what I'm saying? Right. Like, no one no, does you're that. Not. Right, right. Right. But it's important to take all of those things um, into consideration. Right. Because when I was I went, I dove as deep and uh, 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 deep in to see that, OK, well, this county where because we lived in different cities um, mm -hmm. like this city that that the case was being held in is a little bit more lenient to or favorable to moms. Right. But if, if our case would have been in this city where I was living at it was a little bit more favorable to dads at the time. Um, and those are just things that we don't think about. Like when we're going through yeah, this, like those are variables that we don't really touch on. Absolutely. And, and just to kind of um, add to that as well, the same County that I'm referring to Collin County, ironically, that is known for being a very father friendly County. I, that's why I mm -hmm. practice there a lot. And if you're bored or you, you know, have time, you can actually go Google the Deion Sanders divorce. It took place in Collin County and all of the, the fact that he got all custody of all of his children, you know, that was pretty much groundbreaking or unheard of back yeah. then. And so, um, well, I, you know, it was money, but that's one of those counties where the father is definitely given the benefit of the doubt. And we, but you got to know about, where you I are. Go back just, you have to. You have to. We talked a little bit about um, modification. And a lot of times, you know, when I talk to dads, they don't know that uh, circumstances can change that can that can cause or can help them with a modification. Talk to a little bit about uh, the process or if a custody agreement can be changed after it's set by the court. What does that look like? So typically, um, let's just say you go and you sue me for a breach of contract and you win. You get you win your case, you get a judgment, you owe me, I owe you, I gotta pay you a hundred dollars for breaching this contract. That's it. That's the end of the case. Unless, of course, you chose to appeal it or something, but that's it. It's mm -hmm. over. In family law cases. Because people in life are so fluid, nothing is ever final in family law. And the standard that we use here in Texas is uh, deals with any time there is a material and substantial change in circumstances, you have or potentially qualify for a modification of the child support or the conservatorship, which we've already discussed. Um, so that could look like getting a new job or getting fired from a job that can look like mm -hmm. having another kid that can look child. like moving to another state that can look like um becoming disabled that can look like i mean it can look like so many things because life changes things mm -hmm. happen so you have the op the opportunity or the remedy 
to be able to file for a, a modification wherein those issues that were included in that last order are then revisited to see if they con if, if, if a, a change is, is, is justified. Yeah. And what is the, I don't want to say the likelihood, right? But if, if let's say I'm so, okay, let's, I'm going to give a scenario. Let's say I'm a dad and I have, you know, a custody order that's in place. I got every other weekend um, based on, you know, I went to court, but now, you know, a couple of years have passed and I feel like uh, I'm more suitable. My, 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 you know, I, I'm married now and I, I'm, I'm living in a home and, you know, all of these things have come into play. Um, why would it be beneficial for me to, 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 to rock the boat a lot of times? Because a lot of times dads, we don't want to uh, go back to court because we say, oh, we, you know, she's going to try to get me for more child support or she's going to try to do this or she's going to try to do that. So I'm not even going to do it. And I think a lot of that is based in trauma. I think a lot of it is based in ignorance. Um, but what is the uh, the benefit, you know, to going back and rocking the boat to to fight for your rights as a father? Well, the main benefit is going to be, I mean, this sounds cliche, but it don't lie, but you're living in your truth. I mean, because if you mm -hmm. are still abiding by or complying with an old order that no longer is workable or that doesn't fit your lifestyle anymore, then you're doing yourself and your child or children a disservice because mm -hmm. you could actually maybe now, for example, maybe you had a job that required you travel a lot in the previous right. order so that you were only right. given a little bit of time one weekend out example. of the month. Now mm -hmm. you're a stay at home Zoom, you, you're working at home remotely, you're home mm -hmm. all day, every day. Now the kids can come overnight during the week. So right. we can revisit that because that's going to enhance your relationship with your children. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't you want to, you know, accommodate those changes? That's the benefit. And I tell guys, you know, there is always a risk um, whenever you, uh, the mom, when the, the, when the mom is triggered, because of your new, your new girlfriend or your new fiance or whatever, and she files her modification and you call her office and you come in for a consultation. The thing about it is your change, or, or, or I'm sorry, her change, and she's, she's using your change in circumstances, there we go, to justify the request. Let's say she's looking for an increase in child support. Well, if you're making more money now than you did then, go ahead and, 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 and go, I mean, and do it because that's the, that's you're, you're depriving your kid. You're, mm -hmm. you're, you're not living. And that's the best way I can put it. You're not living in your truth. I don't know if that's a silly way of looking at it, but I think you should want something that is more workable for your current lifestyle, your current life, because that's what's going to be most beneficial to your children. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I think a lot of it is rooted in trauma. Like, you know, just as someone as a black man standing in front of a judge or a judge and a guardian at litem and having them be the ones to decide how much time you get to spend with your child or how much time you get to see your child or what you can. Like, listen, it, it's life changing. Like, it is one of the most hurtful things to to go through, right? When you're trying to do everything that you that you could do to be a part of that child's life, but to have someone say, oh, you know what? You're only worthy of having first, third, fifth weekend, 30 days in the summer. That that's a trauma that people don't talk about, right? We don't, we don't, we don't talk about the 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 emotional effects that come with that, that, you know, out of 365 days in a year, you're only allowed to see your child, however many of those are weekends and a month in the summer. Um, or the emotional effect that comes with, you know, having to um, say goodbye to your child in, in, you know, on June 30th and then having to go an entire two months of a summer without, I'm going to tell you, it hurt. It hurt. And, and, and a lot of us, you know, at that point we get to it where we, where we, where we give up or what we do is we, 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 in our mind, and I know this from talking to fathers, we say that we're going to wait until the child gets to a certain age and yeah. make the decision. So it is that a thing? Because I know 
a lot of us think that, okay, when the child becomes, you know, 12, then that's when I'm going to go back because that's when she can say that she wants to live with me. Right. Is that a thing? Or is that sort of like, uh, an old wives tale that the child can go to the judge and sit in, sit in front of the judge and say, your honor, I want to go live with my dad for the, you know, the rest of the time that I'm under the age of 18, or is that something that was just made up? Well, it's not, it's, it's not an old wives tale. Um, in the Texas family code, for example, there is, um, there are provisions that determine when a judge must consider the child's wishes or desires as to whether or not they want or as to which parent they want to live with. And in the state of Texas, the age is 12. So if they're over the age of 12, the judge must consider. That doesn't mean the judge must do what the child wants. The judge must interview the child if a parent asks and must take the child's desires and wishes into consideration. If they're less than 12, it's discretionary. The judge can grant the interview depending on how old the child is and depending on, again, what the facts are. But yes, children are allowed to express um, either in chambers with the judge. Some judges talk to the children directly, depends on the court you're in, or some judges send them to our family court services that most counties have where there's a social worker or a therapist or someone who will sit down and interview the child as to their wishes. But those that can be very um, tricky because your child does not always say what you think that they're going to say. Your child is going to more likely than not um, tell the truth about what's going on and that may not be favorable to you or it may not be favorable to the other parent. Um, It just depends, it's risky. I've had had some that have helped and I've had some that have harmed. So it just depends, but yes, that is a a request that the parties can make in a family case. Yeah, and I've honestly heard of uh, in some states, a judge not wanting to put the child through the whatever they feel like comes with putting them on the stand. So that's why you say they would bring them into chambers and have that conversation. And that, you know, it's funny that you said that that made me think of something else. How in those situations, because (laughs) because sometimes, you know, I tell people all the time, custody battles are the worst types of situations (laughs) that it brings the worst out of people. You will see a side of a person that you never thought existed, right? And again, I, I work with a lot of fathers and I hear these stories. And, and, and one of the things that comes up a lot is that people will, um, they will tell lies or they will tell the child certain things or they will make claims about abuse or they will make claims about uh, you doing things to the child that just aren't true, Right. And as a father or as a, uh, or any parent, right? I think, you know, having someone assassinate your character or do something or have the child brainwashed to a degree to say, okay, when the judge brings you in here, you're going to say that your dad beat you with a shoe, or you're going to say this. Um, how, how do you help your clients navigate like false allegations and navigate through, um, those tough things that, you know, when, when, when either your child or child protective services or the other parent is making claims against you that you just, you know, aren't true. Well, I mean, obviously uh, there are a couple of things. Um, the first thing is the professionals who are interviewing the children are trained and they typically can tell if the child's been coached or been told to lie and they will include that in their report that they then draft and send to the judge. But nevertheless, how do you disprove false allegations from the other party? Um, Obviously testimony, evidence. Um, If you have the ability, if your county that you're in offers what we call a child custody evaluation, which is an extremely uh, detailed, thorough process where they go into the party's homes, they interview, the parties, the children, they look at the living conditions, the living environment, 
all of this. And this goes on. They go into the parties, criminal backgrounds, employment backgrounds, everything. It goes all. I mean, it is a very, very wide net that they will cast. Excuse me, talking to the child's teachers, looking at attendance, all of these things. And then they will make a determination based on what they've seen and what they um, observe or heard and then decide or, or whatever weight they want to give to it in the report. But there's really no other way um, because judges are not going to put a child on the stand in a custody case. It's not happening mm -hmm. in a divorce case. Mm -hmm. It's not happening. It's not happening. Right. Right. Um, another question that comes up a lot of times is that uh, sometimes a parent who uh, might be the parent that the child lives with um, or spends more overnights with, they want to move out of state. Um, and, you, you know, you hear a lot of times that, again, the other parent doesn't necessarily know how to fight that. Right. So once a court custody order is in place, I want you to speak to when it is in place and when it's not in place, what's the difference between the decisions that a parent can make to move out of state between whether there is a, a custody order, order already in place or a custody order not in place? What's the difference between the two situations? So let's start with if there is a custody order in place. If you recall when we were first starting this, this conversation, I mentioned that when you are given rights, or maybe I did, maybe I just thought it, but I, I thought I said, um, when you are given, it's Friday, um, when you are given certain rights, it's on you to exercise them, okay? So possession and visitation, whatever we, you want to call it, is a right. If you're not exercising that right that you are given in the existing court order, and then mom or whomever says, hey, I want to move to Florida, well, you got to show a court, you got to make a showing to the court how this move is detrimental to your relationship with your kid. But if you're not even exercising the possession that you've already been granted, chances are the judge is going to let that mom or whoever go, especially if it's for a better job opportunity, which ultimately trickles back down to benefiting the child. The child, right. Second scenario, there is no court order, then you don't need to go to court um, except to, oh, okay. I, I think you're asking if you, if you want to stop that parent from moving, mm -hmm. then what mm -hmm. you let, let's say, let's say, let's say the parent is executing the visitation and they're doing everything that they're supposed to do in the original order. But parent number one says, you know what? I'm moving to California. Uh huh. We live in Georgia. Mm -hmm. What can number one with the court order? Is it possible? Can it be done if I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to be doing? Number two, without a court order, is it possible? Okay, so let's, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad we kind of restarted the question, but what we have and what you're referring to are geographic restrictions. You'll see them sometimes in custody orders or um, decrees wherein the parent who is granted the right to determine the child's primary residence will be restricted to a certain county. For example, if you lived here, you would be restricted to Dallas County and nearby contiguous counties. And contiguous just li literally means any county that touches Dallas County. So mom can or dad can move to Fort Worth because Tarrant County touches Dallas County. Plano. And that's, automa move. that's automatically in the orders? Most times. Judges mm -hmm. most times will put in a or require a geographic restriction because they want to continue to facilitate the relationship between that child and the, the non-custodial parent, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, they don't want the other parent moving the child all over Arizona to Michigan and you, you got to pay to go see and travel mm -hmm. and buy tickets. And it just becomes, you know, more ar arduous and, 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 and expensive and costly than it needs to be an inconvenient. And it takes a toll on the child. Now mm -hmm. that's that scenario. Let's say there is no order in place. You and I, I tell you, you know, hey, I got this job. I just passed the bar in Connecticut. 
I'm going to work for a firm in Connecticut and I'm taking the kid. And you're like, no, no. Then you would go file an original case where you would establish the conservatorship, the child support, and whether or not there's going to be a residency restriction. Mm -hmm. So you would just start further back in the process versus in a modification, which is what first scenario was. If you already have an order in place and mom is wanting to move, you would be fighting her modification because she would be filing to have that geographic restriction lifted. Mm -hmm. And that's that's interesting. And that's one of those things that that I think is important for folks to educate themselves. Right. Because what you what you just said in terms of the custody order already being in place, I don't think those um, exist in every other state. Like that was my first time ever hearing that 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 like the geographical oh. um, restrictions wasn't something that you had to like argue for, right? Um, so I think in some states, like you got to really you got to say, okay, well, I don't want her to leave the state. You know what I'm saying? Or I don't want the other person to be able to leave the state with my child. Um, can you now, now put we're that, talking can you have about, them put it in the order? Okay, so a couple things. Court orders are done or, or rendered one of two ways. By the judge's ruling or by the agreement of the parties. Mm-hmm. Nine mm-hmm. times out of ten, the parties can agree to whatever they want. If you and I don't want a geographic restriction, you don't care if I move, cool then there won't be a geographic restriction if we agree upon it. Well, more likely than not, if we go to trial or we have a hearing about our our situation, even if the court does grant me the primary designation, more likely than not to ensure fairness to you and the child's best interest and to keep that relationship, you know, to optimize that relationship, they will restrict me to Dallas County and nearby contiguous County mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. without you asking, without yeah. you asking. Um, but most times judges will put that in place. Right, right, right. That's good. That's good. Uh, so as we're wrapping up, I want to talk about um, communication, right? Because I think in the midst of all of this, the one thing that I think gets overlooked a lot of times, a lot, so many times, um, is communication. And I think if parents had better communication skills with each other, a lot of times they wouldn't even come to H. Nicole Johnson Law, right? They wouldn't need to because they would be able to have the skills and work these things out. Uh, so how? what are some strategies that you think could be put in place to handle communication when the, when the co-parent is, is being difficult? Um, everybody it's, it's, it's needs to go to, to therapy. Everybody. Absolutely. We all, I have a therapist and I don't even have kids. Everybody <laughs> needs to go to therapy. I got, I got two kids. Therapy. So you know, I got a therapist. <laughs> 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 I might need another one. <laughs> you might need another, you need a team of therapists, right? Right. But no, seriously, like that's, I tell clients, I mean, let's be real. You know, my clients, we, we get friendly because we spend a lot of time together. So we talk right. and I tell them, dude, I'm not a therapist. I'm just a lawyer. These issues that you and this person have, have been in existence since before I came along. They've been mm-hmm. in existence before this child was even born. These are things that you've got to work out with yourself because how you work out, how you handle yourself on the inside is going to determine how you co-parent. If you want peace, if peace is a priority for you as a person, you're going you're going to peacefully co-parent or you're going to co-parent in a way that ensures or maintains peace. If you still have feelings, hate is just the same as love. I don't even if a guy is yelling and screaming about his baby's mom, I'm a GA or he can't stand her. I he will never hear from me again on a date. Jeez. Because that tells me <laughs> it's still an emotion. There's still an emotion. Yeah. And if you're still emotionally att- attached to these people, lawyers can't, judges, we can't do anything about that part. Because so, so, that's the so part that impacts that. the co parent. It's, it's so funny you said that. You let me write, let me write into my next question. How can a parent keep their emotions in check? Right? Because again, these this is some. 
This is a lot of times this be war, right? This be the war of the roses, Listen. and you're dealing with the emotions of somebody that you were you were. It's 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 different emotions because you're dealing with the emotions of dealing with your ex, but you're also dealing with the emotions of like fighting for your child, right? So how can you keep your emotions in check? Therapy. Mm. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I don't know the answer because, you know, every situation is different. If I've yeah. got a case where a guy had a woman, had two women pregnant at the same time, how can, what, what can I say? If one, if my client is the, one of the women, for example, mm -hmm. there's nothing I can say that's going to make her feel better about what this right. guy did to her. Nothing. There's nothing the judge can say. There's nothing the order can say. She's going to have to work or heal that on her own, unfortunately, but it will absolutely, it's a guarantee that it's going to succeed into her co-parenting or his co-parenting unless there is an intentional, an intentional attempt to work on, okay, let me just take myself out of it and just do this for the kid. And for the average human, that's extremely hard, especially if you've invested and you've given someone a child. That's like the highest gift of them all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And great it's advice. Hard great. For some people to let go. It's it's super hard, and some people, you know, still don't know how to let go, even when the child is an adult, even when the even when both parties have moved on to other relationships. Um, <laughs> some people don't know how to let go, right? And I I, I think that. <laughs> I think that, um, you know, oh. as, as parents and as co-parents, I think we have to keep the child at the forefront. Um, the emotions are going to be there as, and I think it's okay to, to feel the feelings, right? You want to feel the feelings. That's totally fine to feel the feelings of whatever the situation is, whatever the, um, the things that you all have been through together, whatever, it's okay to feel those feelings. But remember that your 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 child needs both of you, right? And what can you do to be sure that you are sustaining a a, a healthy co-parenting relationship and making sure that your child has both parents um, in his or her life? And that like that's your job. Like that's your job to be sure that the child has everything that they need to become healthy, happy, and whole. So uh, we can wrap right there. This is a great episode. Very informative. I'm glad we finally got you on the show, man. I know it um, took forever for our schedules to align. And yeah, I, I'm glad I did it though. You're not the first I've done. Like, this is probably my third or fourth um, influencer who's, in, who's asked me to do something like this. So anytime mm -hmm. you need me, I'm available. I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, I, my, my office has way more color and it would have looked much better on screen. I just didn't think about it until I opened this up. But next time, if you need me, I'm gonna I'll, I'll come live from my office. You have purple. I'll have red. My office is red. Next time, yeah, we will, we will, we will have you <laughs> back so we can talk a little bit more about this. Tell the people how they can get in contact with you. Your Instagram handle is already up, but tell them if they're in the Dallas Fort Worth area, uh, how they can get at you, how they can um, hire you to be their attorney, and you know help them get custody or whatever it is they're trying to get. So if you are in need of our services, you can call the office 469-687-6718. That's 469-687-6718. Or you can actually go to my website, hnicolelaw.com, and you can submit an online um, inquiry for information and we'll get back with you. Um, and you can go ahead and get scheduled for a consultation and come in. Um, and we can chat by via Zoom or on the phone or in person, which whichever you prefer. Dope. It's Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate you for coming on the show. We will definitely you. have you back. Um, don't forget if you listen to the podcast, if you're watching to us on watching us on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe, share, like the show, tell all your friends about it, send it to somebody who might need this information. Uh, and also make sure you join the Black People Parenting Facebook group. It's a private Facebook group. You just hop on there. You just submit your request to join and we'll let you in. It's a great community of black parents uh, just sharing their experiences, man, and just leaning on each other. Because I think as, as parents, that's what we need. We need to have these types of conversations and we need to get this type of information uh, from folks who can help us be the best parents that we can be. All right. So, you know how I said, don't forget to take care of each other, take care of your kids. But in the midst of it all, be sure that you take care of yourself. We'll highlight you on the next episode of Black Parenting. Y'all, peace.